from the time of the Spanish Civil War 1936 to 39 to 1975, the Franco regime was responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths, wrongful imprisonments, punishment, extrajudicial killings, and repression of entire classes of people, most of those who had fought with leftist forces during the Civil War and their families. One of the main targets of Francoist repression was women. Under his dictatorship, women were systematically stripped of newly gained freedoms and forced back into roles dictated by archaic traditions and severe conservative Catholic values. Women faced unimaginable horrors, including imprisonment, abuse, and torture. Before the Civil War, Spain was one of the most backward-looking and conservative countries in the world. What's more, the monarchy and its government worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Catholic Church in Spain long known as the most conservative branch of the Catholic faith. Since the time of the Age of Exploration and the Spanish Inquisition in the 1500s, Spanish cardinals and archbishops had a great degree of autonomy from Rome, and often went far beyond what was sanctioned by the Vatican in terms of involvement and the repression of ideas that were deemed antichrist. Even though droves of women were forced by economics into the factories and workhouses of the country during industrialization, many Spanish men and not a small number of traditional conservative women, believed that a woman's place was in the home. Women were supposed to be like angels, pure and protectors of their children and family, from the home, not the workplace. To a degree, southern and rural Italy and much of Portugal outside the capital were the same. Women were to be seen and not heard, at least in public. When they were seen, it was in the company of a male relative or husband. To a large degree, Spain was a religious, fundamental state, much like Iran is today. For many reasons, including working outside the home and seeing the world beyond the kitchen, democratic and socialist literature smuggled into the highly censored society and the development of radio and moving pictures, Spanish women and men began to realize in how many ways their country was behind the rest of Europe. By 1931, a groundswell of popular support and demands for change had forced the, temporarily, last Spanish king, Alfonso XIII, to abdicate. Unfortunately for the liberal, mostly urban forces in Spain, much of the countryside and most of the military were still exceedingly conservative. Like most ultra-conservative movements, they believed in a return to a golden age, when Spain was a world power, closely following the dictates and teachings of the Spanish Catholic Church the most militant in the world. The nearly four-year civil war resulted in nearly one million deaths, both military and civilian. The war became an international battleground, with weapons and equipment flowing into both sides. The liberal forces of the Republicans, which became increasingly harsh and communistic as the war went on, and the Nationalists, who eventually came under the control of General Francisco Franco by late summer 1936. The Soviet Union supplied weapons, money, and revolutionary agitators to rally the leftist cause. And Nazi Germany and Italy supplied and supported Franco. The Franco Era When Franco and his nationalists took over, they didn't simply install a conservative military rule and go back to what Spain had been before the turn of the century. Franco's movement and party, known as the Falange Española Tradicionalista y de las Juntas Ofensivas Nacional Socialistas, or Spanish Traditionalist Falange and the National Socialist Defensive Juntas. Falange is Spanish for phalanx, the ancient Greek military formation, and people around the world know it by its Spanish name. Many times it was called and is called the Falange. It is often known by its acronym Fat Johns. Johns being a small but influential fascist party that grew before the Civil War. The number of men and women killed by the regime after the Civil War was estimated shortly after the death of Franco at about 35,000. But historians believe that number was much higher, at least 100,000. These were the number of people summarily executed after the war, and they included not only men and women who were known to have fought against Franco, but many who were just suspected of supporting the Republican cause. Many of these were likely victims of neighbors who held grudges for one reason or another, or who wanted to prove their loyalty to the Falange by turning in traitors. After the 
initial wave of terror, survivors with Republican or suspected Republican sympathies were the victims of a wave of repression, similar to what happened to political opponents in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. They were jailed, often without charge. Punishment was common. Prisoners in jails were overcrowded, leading to violence and disease. Concentration camps were built nationwide to put people to work at heavy labor. While there were no extermination camps in Spain, members of the indigenous Basque minority in northeast Spain were particularly hard hit, as were the Catalonians in the area around Barcelona, a hotbed of revolutionary activity and liberalism before the Civil War. One of the regime's biggest targets was women. Immediately after taking power, the Falange began a propaganda campaign and repressive policies designed to force women into the roles that Franco and his followers believed were the only proper roles for them housewife and mother. Movies and radio plays extolling traditional female virtues such as keeping the house and raising children were promoted heavily. The regime encouraged Spanish women to have as many children as possible, but only if they were married. Within a very short time, the Falange either revoked Republican laws allowing women more freedom or passed new ones limiting it. Unmarried women under 25 were required to live with their parents. Women were not to be alone in public without a male relative or husband. Most forms of employment were off-limits, though there were exceptions for women who were over 25 and unmarried, widowed, or whose family had died. Those exceptions usually meant long hours in front of sewing machines and the like, six days a week, for up to 12 to 14 hours a day. Over time, regulations on what women could wear were passed, though they weren't nearly as oppressive as the dress codes we think of when we think of places like Afghanistan. Spanish women were forced to follow the rules of modesty passed by the state. By the late 60s and 70s, these fashions had become slightly more modern, and they usually involved basic colors like black and white. A typical summer outfit for young women might be a knee-length skirt and a relatively loose-fitting polo-style top. In church, for sure, and in most public buildings, a scarf or kerchief was required. Before Franco, women could vote. After Franco, they couldn't. Upper education was available to women, but discouraged. Those who graduated from college were pressured to enter traditional women's occupations like teaching, nursing, etc. Abortion, even in the case of incest, rape, known congenital disabilities, or the life of the mother, was strictly forbidden. A booming black market in back alley abortions rose throughout Spain. Anyone caught performing an abortion or having one was subject to lengthy jail terms. Unwanted pregnancy increased. Because the use of birth control, other than the church-sanctioned rhythm method, was forbidden and also carried a jail sentence. One of the more remarkable things about fascist Spain in general, and its repression of women in particular, was the use of church organizations to help the regime, especially sisterly orders meaning nuns and convents. The orders and the church generally worked hand in hand with the regime. For many of the issues regarding women, especially young women, sisterly orders were the organizations that essentially dictated to a large segment of the population. They even went so far as to have spies, women, sometimes nuns, sometimes not, who would go undercover in places where younger people gathered. There they would work as informants for the government and the church. They weren't simply looking for women who might have turned to prostitution, mainly because their husbands, fathers, and brothers were dead. They were also looking for young women who had, in the eyes of the regime, fallen or were at risk of falling. In other words, fallen from the so-called angelic state portrayed by the government. This didn't mean what we think of as criminal, theft, assault, etc., though it could. Mostly what the nuns and their spies were looking for was loose behavior meaning close dancing, drinking, smoking, inappropriate dress, too much makeup, loud voices, conversations with boys or men, and much else. Of prime concern to the state was a girl or unmarried woman who had lost her virginity. The worst situation was unmarried pregnancy. That woman was already fallen and was a danger to those around her. The government church organization responsible for keeping women in line was the Fet Johns. Sechion Feminina, staffed at its higher levels by the wives of powerful men and at mid and lower levels by nuns. Sechion Feminina quickly developed into a repressive organization. At its worst, it operated institutions, more like jails and camps than rehabilitation centers. 
designed to put young women on the right path. What's even worse about this situation is that girls and women had very few legal rights or recourse. For example, young girls whose families could not afford to take care of them or who were argumentative were simply accused of something. In many cases, the Seccion Femenina and their male agents would show up without explanation to the girls or women and take them away for re-education. Other times, they were dropped off, meaning abandoned at the centers. Most of the time, re-education meant forced labor, making consumer goods, needlepoint, and clothing manufacturing. The famous U.S. astronauts drink, Tang, and its labels and containers was made in Spain for a time by women who had no choice. Food was decent, but sparse, and many girls and women lost weight. This was the case even when pregnant, which of course meant that there were many miscarriages. Stillborn babies were often buried on site. Even today, when a new building goes up or an old one comes down, there have been instances where the bones of infants by the dozens or more. The loss of weight, lack of sunlight, and much else contributed to many women getting sick, often led to them becoming sterile. The young women and girls sent to the institutions run by Seccion Femenina and the various sisterly orders were also subject to physical, mental, and sexual abuse. This became apparent right from the start. The first thing a new resident was forced to do was strip, bend over, and allow herself to be inspected by either a male doctor or nurse, sometimes a nun, to see if she was still a virgin. In many places, this was done weekly, for at times, the women were allowed to work outside the centers. The worst of them was the Peña Grande Maternity Hospital in Madrid, run by the Order of the Evangelical Crusades, considered the most conservative and harsh of all the orders. Peña Grande was well known and two other centers run by the Evangelical Crusades were considered the worst. At Peña Grande, a section of the hospital was off limits to all except those who worked or were in prison there. This was called the Seccion Prohibito, and though most of the records of Peña Grande and institutions like it were destroyed when Franco died, without a doubt to hide the crimes that took place there, it is well known that beatings, psychological torture, forced sterilization, and sexual assault all took place in that ward. Worst of all were the adoptions. We would call them kidnappings. Pregnant women, some as young as 11 years old, who had been violated, often by a family member who called the Seccion Feminina to come and get the wayward and fallen girl, had their children taken at birth or shortly after, and given either to childless couples from the ruling or upper classes, or in some cases, sold, even before birth. Survivors of Peña Grande recall being brought into a room with several men, stripped, poked and prodded like a prize horse, and then having their unborn child bid on. The highest bidder got a new baby. Yes, this was Spain for many years, even to a degree after the death of Franco and into the early 1980s. Millions of people still alive today experienced fascism firsthand, including tens of thousands of women who passed through the Seccion Femenina institutions, as well as children who never knew who their biological parents were, but are now finding out due to DNA testing. When the Spanish monarchy was restored to power after Franco's death and a new democratic system was being built, it was decided that many fascist killers and torturers would go unpunished. Spain was still divided. No one wanted to see another civil war by dredging up unpleasantness. But in 2017, a case was brought to court that concerned the abduction and forced adoptions that took place at Peña Grande. The trial was followed widely, and Spain was forced to come face to face with some of the worst aspects of its fascist past. Dr. Emmanuel Vela, who was the supervising doctor at Peña Grande for years, was found guilty of a variety of charges, but his sentence was suspended due to poor health. He died six years later. This is History on Fleek. See you next time.